Uh, okay, so really quickly, I'd like to go over some of the stuff that got turned in um, uh, two days ago. But just a few things to look at. Again, if I'd like show your work, it's not because I'm trying to humiliate you. It's just because it was symptomatic of other stuff that um, people were doing. So the first one I'm going to look at here is Susan's. And this one was actually, I thought, um, pretty well done. Um, some of you guys, it's interesting. Some. <laughs> There's two kinds of people in the world, apparently. There's the people in the world that think, okay, no matter what, I'm going to at least try this. And then there's the people who are like, fuck this, I'm not even going to think, I'm not even, not even going to try. Not, nope, I know it's not going to work. I'm not, I'm not going there. Um, Susan, she actually got it pretty well. She had the right idea. Uh, and the right idea ultimately was this. The right idea was that you needed to cut out the girl, the ultimate head turn. So there's a number of ways that you could do it. You could have actually tried to turn the head using liquify tool and then just simply copied this face and painted the face back on. That would have worked. Um, but at the end of the day, it was some variation on this. You could have tried puppet warping again. It introduces a certain amount of distortion. And so the solution is at the end, you get it as good as you can possibly get it. And then you literally just copy the face. We all know how to do that part, right? Just to make sure, I'll show you really quickly. So even at, its, at, at, at the very least, again, down here on her base layer, I'm going to turn everybody else off. Uh, simply lasso tool, copy her whole head like this. Probably, I, for me, I think I would have done what she did. I think I would have copied more of the body, but nonetheless, copied the head like this. Command J to jump that to its own layer, and it doesn't want me to do that, so I'll unlock that layer. and Command J, and I have it all on its own layer right now. It looks like that. Command T to bring this up, rotate the head till it's correct, whatever. And then what a lot of people mistake on this though, because this part works really well for her. It works really good for her eyes and for her nose and for her mouth, but what doesn't work well is this. If you look at what's happening to her hair right here on this side over here, because she's actually leaning over pulling away from her because of gravity, you would go in with liquify and you would push this back in so that it did not look like it was doing exactly what it is doing. Does that sort of make sense to everyone? So at any rate, I thought all of this was pretty well done. What I didn't think was well done and what was a little unnerving about this is that if you take a look at her layer stack, you'll see that she actually does have, this is how the body is, is done. It is in a small but when I open it up, it's, um, there's nothing in here. There's, I mean, it's just the original image. Smart objects that are actually causing this to be, um, uh, to, I don't know where this change exists. And all I can say is that ultimately it's been baked into the file. It was a smart object or she didn't do it on a smart object. She simply did it on a regular layer or whatever. But this is problematic because there's no going back. You know what I mean? There's no way to like fine tune this if all of a sudden, because uh, this happens to everyone. You wake, up a day, you wake up the next day and you're like, and you're looking at the work you did the night before and you're like, oh my God, that was way too much, or oh, and that's not enough or whatever. So at any rate, it's just like my entire life, my whole life from when I was three was all about keeping the back door open, a side window open. I always was trying to do something some way I shouldn't be doing it. And that's the way I feel about this work. I would never close the door on anything. I, do, I go to great lengths to keep all of those options always open to me. Um, I'm commitment phobic. Uh, so that's that guy. We don't need to save that. Marge isn't here, but she'll pick it up in the video. There are things that people simply assume that shouldn't be assumed. And this is one of them. So it doesn't look too bad, right? Looks relatively good until you see this. All of a sudden, the obviously repeated pattern right here, but then the mysterious hunk that starts from nowhere and then continues and it's like well you didn't spot that you know so again this is this whole line right here that is a huge problem but again when I look on this you know I see small little things that she's actually got going on in here I think she's trying to fudge it a little bit but if this was my image and that I was actually working on this part and I was hell-bent and determined to keep all of this going right here 
I'm not really sure I am, but if I was, again, I would come up to the very top, Command, Option, Shift, hit the letter E, it merges everything together. So now I could go in conceivably with the uh, uh, clone stamp tool or the healing brush tool. We'll see what healing brush looks like. I've got to kill this thing right here because it's repeating pattern right here. So I don't know whether I would sample up here and can carry, carry through all of that. That didn't do a thing. Try and clone stamp tool, see if that has any, gives me any better luck. Again, it's not. And fix that, whatever that connection is. Again, I would probably do this more the way I showed you guys before. Big jump it to its own layer, paint in a mask, to pull it back in to really try to control it. I, I hate trying to do any hair work with uh, clone stamp or healing brush tools. Does that make sense, everybody, though, what we're talking about? All right. So we don't need to keep that. I just, so you, yes. You I tried to get to it before you guys had to do the uh, homework. The puppet work would be far more successful because you do it with less distortion than liquify. The thing about the puppet warp is you really can't get it to go that way. And if you have enough points, it doesn't distort in and of itself. Um, you may get something weird in the neck, but nothing that you couldn't then go back in and fix. But I would, that would be my go-to before liquify. The twirl tool on liquify, uh, it just puts in too much distortion. Because this It looks really good. You know, I think this looks really good. It was actually pretty well done. If you come in really tight on the hair here, you can see he actually kept some good detail in the hair. The things that I typically look for when I look at this is I'm really looking for this. And so it's something I keep trying to tell you guys to do. Even though the results that you have may look stellar, you need to check your layer masks by themselves. I'm going to zip all the way back out so you can see. And you can tell that this is, I mean, you would, you, there's no way you can't see that. You know what I'm saying? So again, it's just to check it to make sure that it, that part was actually working well if I look at this area right down in here I don't even have to sample it I'm looking at the area down at the bottom I'm getting 60s in my readout bring up the levels dialog box and so I'm going to just drag this up till I get close to the 60s I can still spot it down there I can still spot it still spot it in this area right down in here I've actually gotten rid of it I say okay and then I, that's You can eyeball this stuff to a certain extent. Again, I would take the time to put a number down there, um, but you can sort of see where I'm going here. Yeah, that takes just a little bit more, and that's gone completely down. Click on that, okay. Look at my image, and so my before, well, you can see all the staining in there, and that's my after. So it's a simple fix anyway. We got to check the masks, and a lot of and let me go back to the way it looked in the very beginning. Like this mask. It's another way to check. Now, in this case, I think it's more difficult to see the, the, the little bit of black staining on the white background. I actually think this version of it is much easier to spot. Um, but it's just a habit you should get into doing. And I've got a note in here, Connor, about yours, and I don't have any idea what it means, but we'll take a look at it. I know the shoe. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, it's just this stuff down here. Guys, if you take a look at the mask again for this one, that's what the mask looks like. Hit the B key to get a brush, change it to overlay, make it a little bit larger. 
And again, black is going to be my foreground color, so I can actually take up my opacity and my flow both. Overlays my blending mode fine. And you can fix this really pretty quickly. Again, I would typically when I do this, you can see that there's work, um, there's still detail in these shoes. So usually what it is is it's easier to get the shoes to go on white work. That sounds So, um, because again, if I continue to go over like this area right here, if I hit it with the black first, it actually adds a whole lot of black to the shoe part. Um, it, so this was an interesting one. Now, this is the first time at Susan's other file, but I really thought this was. in this image right here. If we take um, but this is another actually I just put uh, take a look in here and you come in tight on this you can see she's actually So it's a way of looking at your spill removal to spot areas because, again, you get seduced into thinking this is all perfect because your image looks amazing. Um, but it's just a way to spot those things. However, what I thought that she had done that was really interesting is that I actually put this second layer up here. Spill is removed. On the layer underneath, there is no spill removal. Um, so if we actually kill this. Uh, you see all the spill is here. So she removes it in this, but then she clips this layer to the background. And then this mask is actually controlling this part right here. And again, there's a million ways that we do this stuff, guys. It was just a clever way of doing it. So I just thought I would point it out. Um, to wait before I close that up. Is everybody feeling comfortable about clipping masks and how they are and what they do and how they work? Yes. Okay. Um, so the other day when we were doing it in class, I thought my pixels were really sharp when I was doing the um, when I was doing the luminosity okay. um, channel, or yeah, I was using the channel to um, bring back the contrast. Right. For the sharpness. Right, 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 right. So, so you just look at spreading to bring the contrast of the edge to make the edge sharper yeah really pixelated that you've lost me on that one so what do you mean by really pixelated so the edges were really sharp too sharp yeah. then you need to back the contrast off you carried the contrast too far okay. that's what's happened so do you guys know what he's talking about does anybody not know what he is talking about? Should we go over this really quickly? Now would be the time. Okay. Um, let's do this. Let me, um, let's get through this part right here um, and I'll find a good image that we can actually, and we'll pass it around and everybody can work on the same image. Because again, it's the kind of thing that you guys need to actually work on this thing to make it right. Okay, so which body comp one? The one for, this, for today's homework. Oh, for today's homework? Yeah. That'll be great. I have no idea which one that is. So we'll actually do that. So don't let me forget that part. Um, I've got a little bit more I want to talk about here really quick. So I want to look at this one of Marguerite's. So in this case, and this is a dead giveaway in this part, whatever, you can see that her mask was too aggressive. 
So it's just when you start to do this, not, you know what we should do? We should actually just knock this figure out. We should go through this with everybody because this is also an issue right here that we can actually spot. So we can kill all those birds with one stone. You guys up for that? Yep, no, okay, wow. Did you all go to Lollapalooza last night? Wait, you, you couldn't be feeling bad. It's over at 10. I said, did you all go to Lollapalooza yesterday? Everybody's just got a little bit of a glazed look right now. It's Friday. Um, okay, at any rate, uh, too aggressive in the mask. We'll actually talk about how to fix that, or not fix it, but how to um, not have it happen. And then, okay. Yeah, the last thing, and this is actually something that I've already mentioned, but I'll just show it to you again to reiterate it really quick. So if we take a look at Marge's also her knockout. Uh, this is what I was talking about before. If you take the initial look at it, it looks at it, things actually look like they're pretty well done. This all seems reasonably well done, whatever. But if you come down here, you can spot the spill that exists right here on the bottom of the boa. Would you call this a boa? Whatever it is. Hairy scarf. All right. Um, if you take a look again at just her spill removal layer, this is her layer right here. If you hold down the shift key and click on this to get rid of the option, you'll actually see all the work that she's done for the hair. So you can see where her spill removal is, but you can also see she missed all of those little fine hairs right there in the spill removal part. She's probably also got spill color happening. We'll see. Probably there's spill, I'm just going to suspect this, that's happening right here along the, um, this fringy edge part right here. And if we uncheck this, we can see it. And indeed, you can see the green spill right there. But where I really spotted it on this one was down here in the bottom. And you can see it right here. And again, if you turn off her mask, you can see there's no spill removal work that's been done around this. So again, it's that whole idea of simply checking those things out or will actually help. Are there questions about this? All right, so if I can get everybody to open a version of this image, uh, I'm just gonna do my work on Marge's because I've got hers already open. Um, I'm gonna throw away everything except for the background layer just so that we can start. We're gonna do this pretty quickly. We're not gonna spend tons of time removing the spill. We'll, we'll go through a little brief part of it, um, but I've got, we've got a lot to get to today. Um, by the way, that reminds me, um, I was talking to Elise was in, oh, speaking of, guys, sorry. Um, does anybody have tablet, uh, did, did anybody keep a tablet over the last couple of days and bring it in today? Does anybody have uh, uh, tablet C-880? So my guess is Marge has got that, because she's not here. Uh, anyway, they're saying that it, it, it was supposed to get back this morning and then come back out, whatever, it's late, anyway, regardless. All right. Um, C-800, I'm sorry, C, the whole, anyway, uh, C-880, okay, I bet that's her. Uh, okay, at any rate, um, oh, okay, just go back and tell them really quickly that you've got it and that you're keeping it, or I don't know what we need to tell, wait, let's do this first, let's get through this knockout part, because you wanted to see this, uh, and then we'll um, uh, make a mad dash back there to figure out what, that is all about. Okay. Um, 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 uh, okay, so we actually just got process on this. Do all of you have an action built to do your zero selective knockout color part? So if you don't have it, I will run, I will walk through it. If you guys do have it, just simply run your action. It'll be easier. If you don't have it, you should make an action for this. Simply add a hue saturation layer, come up and add a hue, I'm sorry, a, um, um, selective color layer. Um, take all of the um, uh, drop down slider colors and drive the black all the way to the right, filling everything with black ink.
And then finally, if your image looks black, it's correct. If it looks solarized, you need to change this relative radio button to absolute and it will look black. And then go back up to the green uh, uh, menu selection and take the black slider and take it all the way to the left, which fills the greens with um, uh, um, uh, white ink. So, and then I'm gonna zoom into the hair because this is where the big problem area is. This is where the challenge ultimately ends up being on saturation slider that's underneath it. I'm going to click on the targeting adjustment tool and if I click on this guy right it actually um, uh, completely saturates that slider. If you drag all the way to the left it totally desaturates that slider and the image disappears. The reason the image because I have just removed the green. If I turn off my uh, selective color, you can see there's very little green. There's the spill is left in her, but there is, other than that, there is no green. Um, so the selective color has nothing to work on because we eliminated the green. If on the other hand, I drag the slider all the way to the other direction, it super saturates the green, but you can also see what it does to the hair here. It absolutely destroys the hair. If we look at this in real time, uh, I'm gonna zero the saturation out on this. So again, it's in the greens is where it's being selected. So in the greens, if I take the saturation all the way back to zero, this is sort of where we were starting, is at this stage of the game. Again, I'm gonna back out just a little bit and I'm looking at the quality of this edge hair. So again, clicking on the targeting adjustment tool, click and start to drag. And what I start to worry about in this, we'll, you can see it on this other side over here. I start to worry about some of this hair that's beginning to go too white. Now some of this I am willing to give up on, but I need to keep some of this softer texture, whatever. In some cases you can drive the saturation all the way, completely. In other cases, if we take it too far, you'll see what happens. And this is a telltale sign of it right here. It's all this hair, all of this weird funky shit starts happening right in here. You can see there's a lot of this hair that's actually gone lighter than the background. The hair's all started to break apart. There's no continuous strands in here. Um, uh, um, whatever, everything is just like getting to break up too much. That integrity. Now, you want to clean it out somewhat, but I'm going to try to restore some of that integrity. And in my case now, again, uh, it, what I would do in this is simply look around. Um, I'm a little nervous about this top. I may back that saturation off slightly more. Yeah, I'm not going to get a whole lot more because there's blonde hair in here too. Part of the reason those things are so light. But I feel like this is holding things together a little bit better over there. I'm looking around here. I'm feeling better about all this. So I'm going to go, I'm going to run with this one. So this is how I'm going to leave it. Then I'm going to come over here in my RGB channels. And again, if you click on the RGB channel at the top, and take a look at the background, you can see that it's a lighter gray, which is helping me. But if we go down and take a look at the red channel that's right underneath, and then go back to the RGB version, you'll notice that the red channel is actually lighter than, um, than the RGB version. So I want to copy one of the actual color channels. The RGB, the, the relative channels, the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel are all identical. So it doesn't matter which one of these co we copy, but we will end up with a better a mask that's got more contrast in it than if we load the luminosity. We could load the luminosity of this channel. So again, you could click on it to load the luminosity and then save it, and it would look just like the RGB channel. I'm going to hit Command D to deselect the channel, drag it down to the copy, and I'm going to call it knockout. These channels right here, they've done their work. I mean, the, uh, the adjustment layers here have done their work. So uh, then I'm going to come to And then I'm going to zoom in. If you look at all this modeled background, for instance, you can see, I don't know if you can see this on my screen. Yeah, you can see here. this uh, this model background is a little bit darker here than this area uh, that's right next to it is. 
If I sample the area that's right next to it and get that to white, there will still be some sort of tone in this darker area. But if I click on the darker tone and get it to go to white, these lighter tones will actually easily get there. So in my case, it's a point, I've got two points on this image, I have no Great, I'm going to go to and I can see I go to my arrow keys and I start to tap down and the second I get to 255 I stop and then before I actually hit the OK button again I take a look around the hair especially I'm looking at these edges down here uh, I'm going to use the preview check mark to go on and off and I feel like that that's actually doing an extraordinarily good job of that and I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to double click on the hand to kick back out. I've got still things that are happening down at the bottom here that I've actually got to deal with. But for the time being, I want to see how good this mask actually looks. So um, let's go ahead and get some of this area down here really quickly. And we'll start down here right around her feet. I actually am going to go to a tablet for, no, I'm not, because uh, I don't have a blank USB port. Um, OK, so anyway, I'm going to hit the brush to get the B key. Uh, I'm going to change my brush to make sure it is an overlay brush, 100% opacity, 100% flow. I'm going to leave this as a medium hard brush. It'll give me a little control, although hopefully the contrast in this image is controlling all of that for me. And I'm simply going to hit um, uh, uh, the X key to make white my foreground color. And I'm going to start painting through this area that's right by her feet. And you can see I'm actually clipping a little bit on, those sh uh, on her shoes. So in most cases, guys, what I do when I've got a scene like this, and you've already seen me do this, I would use the pen tool to surround these uh, shoes really quickly, but we're in a hurry here, and so I'm not going to do that. I am going to hit the X key to hit black on those shoes first, and then the X key again, and then hit the white around them. It's the same trick I just showed you guys earlier. If you hover on this thing right between her legs, you can actually see there is still tone in this image right here. You can see I'm like at a 254, occasionally gets to a 255. That needs a little love in there. I'm gonna actually see what it looks like up in here, this area right between her knees. And that all still seems pretty clean. So at any rate, uh, I'm gonna run this along the bottom. And you'll see in some cases, it'll actually clean all that out. In other cases here, I've got a little bit left down here. I'm gonna just hit it a second time with my brush and it gets that mostly out right there. Pop that last little part. When we get down here to the shadow that's really underneath her shoe, um, that's gonna be a hard one to get. Again, I'm gonna hit the X key to make that shoe more solid. But to get that guy right down there, again, I would do the pen tool. I would take the time to do the pen tool. But in our case, I'm going to just cheat. I'm going to go back to a normal brush, make sure it's a completely hard brush, and simply clip right around. Oh, hit the X key to paint with white. And I'm going to clip this area. And you can see I've already fucked that shoe up. I should have just taken the time to do. All right, let's just do it. Sorry. Undo this, hit the peak, hit the pen tool, select on the very top, come down. I'm just looking to get rid of the shadow to describe that. That was too aggressive a point on my pen tool. So click here and here and come back up and then simply go around like this to enclose all of that shadow. Fin it, complete your path, come into your path palette Command click the icon to load it as a selection. Come up to the select menu down to modify and feather this and put like a half a pixel feather on it. Again, you just don't want that edge to be too perfect. And then go back to your layers. And again, I'm working on my knockout mask right here. We need to fill this with white. White is my foreground color. So option delete, command D to deselect. And I would go after the other shoes like that as well. But you guys get all this. So I'm not going to continue working on that part anymore because I want, oh, I will show you the last part. So the last part I'm going to do in this, oh, if you'll notice, there is a big old hunk of beads that are right in the middle of this girl's chest that should be black. The color of those beads is actually green. So it was picking that up. So again, the B key to get a brush, make it a normal brush. And in this case, 
uh, make black your foreground color and simply paint those guys out. Double click on the hand, and this is the beginning of a reasonably good mask for me. Now, we could fix the rest of this simply using um, a, a brush. You can hit the B key again, make it a much larger brush. And white is your foreground color, and you could try to paint all this out. It takes a, well, it doesn't take too long to do it, so let's just go ahead and do it. Again, we've already gotten that edge cleaned up pretty good. So I'm working with a completely hard brush now, guys, so that we don't need to worry about it. And this is my mask. Okay, again, I would go in and probably check and see if there's other contamination in here, but I'm feeling relatively good about this part. So then back over, I'm going to scroll all the way up to the top, turn on my RGB guy. I'm going to come back to my layers palette, and then I'm going to add a, simply a, a solid color layer above it is my new background. So again, adjustment layer, come up to the very top, solid color. Uh, it opens up with whatever your foreground color is. That's what's automatically loaded. I'm just going to select the red, uh, 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 the red channel and put in 255. Hit the tab key and go to 255 again. Tab key 255 again, and we are good to go. I'll say okay to that. Then I'm going to copy my background layer by simply dragging it down to the little dog-eared guy. Raise it up above my solid color. So I've got the virgin down here, my new white background right here, and the new copy up here that I'm actually going to remove spill on and put a layer mask on. I'm going to go back to my channels palette, scroll to the bottom, and uh, hover over the icon of my, the, the image of my knockout layer. Hold down the command key and click. That loads it as a selection. Come back to the background layer and click on the add layer mask. And it does what I always do. It always inverts it. So with this inverted, it's showing the background and hiding the uh, figure. Uh, if you simply hit command I, it hides the background and shows and you can see there's an area right up here on my mask that I've actually missed. So with my mask actually selected, I can still go to the B key. And again, I want that area to be black. So hit the X key to make it black and paint out that whole edge right there so that my mask is complete. I'm going to take a look at the hair um, because, again, this was the thing that I was worried about being too aggressive and it actually seems very pretty organic to me. It, doesn't, it didn't fall apart, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm going to hit the B key to get a brush. I'm going to make it a completely soft brush. I'm going to change the blending mode of the brush to color. Oh, but I can't pick color. Why? Because exactly right, Henry. You're exactly on the money. You have to actually select the image layer, not the mask layer. So then I can actually use a blending mode of color. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit closer, make my brush a little bit smaller. I'm going to hold down the Option key to sample this little color of light hair right here. And I'm going to start to paint the spill out. Again, as I got really close, it's interesting, her hair right here is very close in color to her skin tone. So if I actually hit her skin tone slightly, I don't run into too much trouble. That would be a different story on this side of her face over here, but nonetheless. So you guys get all of this. We're all good on that, right? But the spill, I mean, the choking is the question. And so here we go to actually do the choking part. If you come down to this girl's hand, this is where I spot it the most. Um, there is some, it's interesting because her, um, because the outline of the, uh, of the dress itself is so dark, you don't It's probably there, we just don't see it. But you can clearly see that this is the problem right here. This is the thing that needs to be choked. So again, before we do the choke, we want to make a history state of what our image looked like before we choked it. So to do that, click on the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the snapshot button at the bottom of the history palette, the little camera icon. Uh, snapshot dialog should open up. Is that not opening for anybody? All right, it's opening. It is opening for everyone. OK, it's just setting an option. OK, uh, and call it pre-choke and say OK. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and choke this image to see what that really means. What we're really doing is this. And um, hopefully, Connor, this will also help give you a, a better idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, again, I, I want everybody to do this with me. Hold down your Option key and click on the mask, and you will simply see the mask. If you actually, I'm not, I'm just dragging. I'm not actually painting. I think I've got a brush. Yeah, I've got a brush going on right here. But if you actually look at your readouts while you're out here in the black, your readout up in the info palette is zero, zero, zero. As you go across this thing, you'll see you get a, I get a quick six and then a 32. I get in a very, very, very short space of time, I get a few shades of gray and then I'm white. 
once I'm into this, I'm at white. So what I need to do is expand this range of grays, and that's what the blurring does. So I'm gonna come up to the filter menu, and I'm gonna come down to blur, Gaussian blur, and we're gonna hit this pretty hard. Uh, no, we're not gonna hit it with a nine, but go ahead and hit it with like three pixels, and you can see it's expanding between the black and the white. That's what I want. I want to expand those ranges of grays. Now I'm gonna go through all of this and then we're gonna go back and look at it in real time. We're gonna look at it with the figure, with the this. And then if I run levels on this, remember levels do levels remap tone. And so what I'm gonna do of gray. They're not going to affect the blacks and they're not going to affect the whites. They're just affecting these tones of grays that are in between. If I take my black point slider and I start to drag it up, what I'm saying is if you undo that and you do the other slider, if you actually use the white point slider and you pull it back, what you're saying is I want those grays to ask expand. To hit camera, if you've done this, and actually turn your image back on by simply clicking on the image, and we can, let's just go back in time. Let's go back and watch the blur as well. So I'm going to go back to brush tool as well. Make sure that the layer mask is active and selected, and we're going to blur it again. So up to the filter menu, down to blur, down to Gaussian blur. And again, you can see with a three pixel blur, it hits it pretty hard. Uh, it could be too hard. I think actually it is a little bit too hard, but we'll still see what happens. So I'm gonna go ahead and say okay to that. It's made my problem worse, but now if I hit Command L to bring up levels, and again, what I'm going to do is take all of those uh, tones of gray and I'm gonna make them black by dragging this in this direction. And you can see it pulls the image in. But you can also see if you take a look at what's going on in this edge right here, and this is I think the problem that Connor had was is that this edge is still way too soft. I got rid of the green, but that edge is, it's, the skin is just fading away. It's almost as if it's out of focus. So instead what I want to do is I want to sharpen up that contrast. If you come back and grab your white slider now and start to pull it back, you pull back the contrast of that edge. And so this ends up being these iterations. You end up going back and forth about pulling these things in. So Connor, if you come all the way tight like this is what I think maybe you're talking about happened and you end up with that clearly really sharp, almost cut out jagged edge. Is that what was happening to you? Yeah. It's because you're putting in too much contrast, so you gotta back this off. You gotta soften it back out again. I may still have a little bit of spill in here, but I feel like that's actually a pretty good move. However, I'm gonna ask you guys to stop at this point, hit cancel, go back in history, and let's try this instead of with that three pixel blur, let's actually try this with a two blur instead until you I'm gonna go ahead and say okay to that levels dialog box drag this forward to eliminate the spill entirely on that that's out pretty good and then sharpen that edge up slightly it's I'm some of the spill so i'm going to choke it a little bit more and that feels better to me i feel like the edge is better i feel like i've got less of that green i'm going to have to deal with later on so i ended up if you want the same numbers i did i ended up with a 174 and a 231 for my levels values i'm going to say okay to that and immediately hit the um, uh, um, uh, the and then for me in looking at this in that that I needed to if you take a look and you at what's happened right now with this choke I mean look what happened to that hair that's not what we want. So I could go to my pre-choke history state. I could pick this history state up here. Again, you do not want to select the states themselves. You just want to select the little box to the left-hand side to put your history brush source into. So I could paint all of this back, but I really only needed to get it off of her hand. So instead, I'm gonna go all the way down to the bottom. I'm gonna go back two steps in history to before when I, so this is previous choking this image. 
but at the very top, I do have a history state that says post choke. And I'm going to click on the little um, square box that's right to the left of that. Again, I'm not picking the state, just the little box that's next to it. And then I'm going to grab my history brush. It's the one that's right underneath the clone stamp tool. And then I'm going to zoom into her hand. And you can see the choke exists, but now I can paint this with history to get rid of that your brush here, you don't really need to edge of your brush uh, because history is really controlling what you, what's changed, what you see, what you don't see. Uh, I'm going to leave the blending mode as normal, 100% opacity, 100% flow, and I'm simply going to click and paint that entire line out. So this sort of gives me the best, and it is now gone, and that does not look jagged. On this, great. No, no, we need to look at this because if you don't have this part, you're going to hate your life. Uh, so you're just working on this one guy here, right? Okay, fine. So, um, so you've gone ahead and have you made your post choke state? Um, yes. Okay, so click on that part. That's fine. However, you're on your pixel layer, not your mask, and all this history work is on your mask. So okay. now try the history brush on that. And you're good to go. Again, it's the thing that happens to people all the time. Connor had it all set up right, and he had the history brush going. He actually selected his pixel layer, and he was trying to paint on the pixel layer. So let me go back with history brush and show you. So this was his situation right here, but his pixel layer was active. And so when he's painting with his history brush, nothing is happening because the change we need to happen have happened is in the mask, not on the pixel layer. So make sure that the mask is selected and you can take all that out. All right, are there questions about this? We good on this part? Okay. You can close that up. You don't need to save that guy. What today? Sarah, can you start me a sign-in sheet, please? Um, I'm going to pass around the um, hard drive to drop your homework. Thanks. Um, okay. Really quickly, I want to take a visit to our website. And to have a quick conversation about where, where we are at and what the plan moving forward is. So where things are at is we got through session perspective, compositing, warp, and building backgrounds. That's the homework you're turning in right now. Instead of taking any questions or, or about that stuff right now, whatever, I want to actually see it. I'll grade it over the weekend. We will take a look at it on Monday. And then questions that you guys have about any of that kind of stuff, we will bring up on Monday. And just like today, hopefully we'll have some time that we can actually tackle those things. Make sense? Uh, okay, so we got through all of that. Interestingly enough, we got through some of this part in here, and we are actually, this is what we're going to go after today. We're going to actually deal with, I'm going to start with, and I'll write this down. Um, we're going to start with uh, depth of field. Um, we are going to do complex shadows. We are to do, let me see what else is really supposed to be happening here. Uh, complex shadows, I'm not going to do lighting effects. Uh, we, we can talk about skin contrast and sharpening really quickly. Uh, yeah, and we are going to get into recoloring the light to dark and dark to light. And so if we get through all of that, then what is left is here in uh, number 12, we can look. If there's anything in here we can get to, we'll talk about removing more ray. We'll talk about that. We'll have other times to pick this up. But again, this session number 12 is the one that I'm going to throw under the proverbial bus to get to, to have squeezed lighting in. If there's something in here, we can actually take a look through this. We can have a conversation about this a little bit later to make sure that I don't feel like you guys are, there's something in here you desperately want to know how to do that we're actually uh, blowing off. However, then next week, this is a conversation.
conversation that I want to have with you guys right now. When I was originally writing this class, in my mind, that you guys were actually you guys were going to ultimately end up walking in here with an exit portfolio that we were going to be working on that portfolio that is clearly too ambitious for the time that we have in this class it's just not possible um, it would be more possible in a semester but to me this really seems more like a year-long project if if we were going to be really serious about exit portfolio so that in mind though I don't want to abandon that I still want everybody to consider working on their semester long projects but when we look at what happens here so the brand you don't need to worry about anything we need for this and we need to go through it because this you're going to do as we go further down into this this is the one that I'm nervous about right here and it is the sequencing and it is this whole process so I don't expect you to have enough new work or whatever your semester project is going to be to make this whole conversation and experience about sequencing meaningful and I want to have this in this classroom as a critique so what I need you to do for me is this even if you don't have a portfolio if you've never considered one if you do have one all of that parts great I need you to come in on this day. This is going to be Wednesday of next week with 30 or 40 of the images that you have done over your whole life that you would consider for a portfolio so that we can have this conversation about sequencing. It, it, it's sort of an exercise. It's not going to be really, or if, if you do have a portfolio, it can be legitimate. Does that sort of make sense what we're going with? But I don't want you to walk in with five images and expect to have the experience of trying to sequence a portfolio of 40 images. That is a completely different experience. Um, I'm going to actually export a whole series of my files and come in and we're going to have that same conversation. But my hope is that we can actually get this stuff up on the board and people can then have a conversation about how does this go how does this flow into this how does that and i want as a full class critique does that make sense what i'm trying to get go for here so i will think more about this over the weekend because i've been struggling with this right now because again i want you to have that experience i want you to have that feedback but I fully realize is that, that, that somehow we need to generate the material for you guys to actually have that experience. So I'm looking for work, that, work that's happened over the last, say, five years of your life that you can actually bring in. Um, and we'll, again, we'll talk, Monday morning, we'll talk a little bit more about that because there's tricks that we can use about making very small prints to actually do the sort of sequencing, editing part, whatever. So I just wanted to plant that seed in your brain so that you know that this part's coming up. Is that okay? And then as we go down through this, we will talk about online portfolios, promos, and resumes. Again, this is a lot of file prep. In this week right here, I'm sorry, this session right here, which is going to be a week from to, I have no idea when this is. Uh, at any rate, um, we will be working uh, in the uh, digital print lab, um, and then final critique, and then again, what we're going through here. If we have time once we get through, so, so just be prepared for this. If, if, if any they just even next Monday if all of a sudden we get through all the branding work first thing in the morning and we've got the afternoon open I want to I want you guys to have whatever files you've got for your semester long project with you so that we can actually start working on that do we start working on the file prep do we start looking at the color do we think about sharpening do we actually get into the digital lab and start to print so you need to think about bringing paper if you're going to work with paper or whatever arrangement you guys have with them I don't really know how the whole print lab works but is this making sense, everyone? If you've got film and you want to scan it, bring that. Just You need to have material ready to work with. It's going to move away from the retouching part more into trying to do finished work and think in those terms. Does that make sense? Do you feel like I'm missing something? I just um, sent an email. I was watching the session seven video when you were talking about copyright. Yes. So just as a reminder, I think at some point, Perfect. No, no, perfect. I'm gonna, I'll put that on my list. Do me a favor. Please shoot me an email about that. We need to have, and those are exactly the conversations that I feel are going to be better for you guys than to say, oh, I think your print's a little blue. You already know it's a little blue. And hopefully now you know how to fix it. Are we good on all of this? 
So, depth of field. Hopefully all of you saved the file last week that I ask you, actually asked you to save. The puppet warp figure that we were working on, the artificial on the fake background, did you guys all manage to save that? It's the one, again, it's the background that we made. It was the, the um, there was a, uh, we had done shadows at the very end. This is how we ended our day at the last day. Did everybody end up saving this? I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, I just figure out. Anybody not have this? Okay. I'm going to throw it on the hard drive really quickly, and then we're just going to, is the hard drive. It is a thing that's going to be called, um, the name I put for mine was back, back, I don't even, background, background wall. That's what you want to copy. It's this one at the very top. So Sarah, here you go. All right. And Katie, do you have a copy of this? Because I've got to put mine on a jump drive for you if you don't. Okay, no. Do it. Her computer hates everything we can connect to it except for this little baby jump drive that's actually got Hasselblad written on it. It was what I got for eight hours of work because there was a time where this was worth a lot of money. Can you believe that? It's like, four, it's like a four gigabyte jump drive. At one time it was worth 120 bucks, about, 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 about two bucks, if that. through before we take a break come back to a complex shadow thing. So again, it's that weird Does everybody have this file now open? So if you look at this file, what we had done at the end of it all was we had built the shadows, whatever, but we were also trying to inter introduce um, um, the illusion of depth of field. Do you guys remember that whole part? And so what we had done is if you come down here to the very bottom, come down to the very bottom layer at the very, very bottom of, of all of this, we had turned that background into a smart object and we had actually put a blur on it, a Gaussian blur on it, and that was just the wall. So if you actually turn off the eyeball for the Gaussian blur, you see the wall gets sharp again. If you turn it back on, it gets soft again. So what we were trying to do was give the illusion of depth of field. We knew that that wall in the background needed to be softer. So is this, everybody got that part? Michael, you're looking for something, I can tell. Okay, here. It's on that. I'll wait. So, and while I'm waiting, I can actually have a conversation about this. So, one of the uh, things that has evolved in Photoshop is, is that initially in Photoshop, and this is a perfect example of this, Gaussian blur. What a Gaussian blur basically does is it looks at pixels that are next to each other and it averages them in. So, for instance, when we've been looking at all these mask lines that we're blurring, it looks at the white at 255, and it looks at the, uh, at the, uh, um, um, the black, which is at zero, and it just tries to take an area in between those two and make it, make it tones of gray in between the two, and it appears to be a blur to us. 
but it's extremely simple mathematics, and it's just that's all it does, right? But where Photoshop has now begun to evolve, the things that, it, that it's actually gotten into that are truly remarkable is that what Photoshop is now giving us is tools that don't emulate how something works. They truly end up doing how things work to your image. So the thing that I'm going to show you right now, it's not just a conventional blur. It's actually a lens blur. And what it's doing is it's not only using AI, it's actually using a really it's an incredibly intensive process to create what a lens would actually see if it was looking at the image that we had just made. And it allows you to modify your lens in many, many, many different ways. So we're not just averaging pixels anymore. What we are going to do is actually essentially create the illusion of this image that we're looking at through a real camera lens. Does that sort of make sense? And it's extraordinary what they've been able to do, but it takes some finesse. You guys, and you're going to have to, you're going to learn this part right now. And so that's the that's the part that I want to try to get to here to the very end. So to do this, guy, I'm going to actually ask you to turn off the Gaussian blur. Oh, let's do this first. Let's do this first. Before you turn it off, can you go ahead and just do a history snapshot of this? So we're going to do a history snapshot of this, and we're going to call this um, uh, um, uh, Gaussian blur. Good word for it. G A U S S I N blur L U R and say okay, um, and then um, simply turn. Let's let's not throw them away. Let's just turn them off. So turn off the eyeball of the Gaussian blur, and then we're gonna do the very same thing for the uh, Gaussian blur that's on the floor. Remember the one that we did on the floor? It's this one that's sitting right down here. And you remember, in order to try to give the illusion of depth of field, we actually did a blur, but then we put a, a, a gradient on this layer mask to actually see the gradient, hold down your option key and click on the mask. And you can see what we were trying to do was say, okay, these areas of white need to be blurred, but the areas of black, I wanna hide the blur. And so the area of black was supposed to be falling right underneath this girl so that she was, the area of the floor under her feet was sharp, but the area in the front was actually not sharp, it was actually blurred, and then the area in the back was also not sharp, it was blurred. Do we really remember that's what we were doing here? So we're going that far, right? Go ahead and turn that guy off as well. Turn its mask off. So uh, again, all the blurring is actually off of this guy. So I don't have any blurs happening on here right now. Everything is sharp, the girl's sharp, the background's sharp, the floor is sharp. Is everybody good on this part so far? And I've got some shadows that are still on the floor. All of that's great. I want you to come all the way to the very top and select the very top layer. We are going to do a merge stamp version of this. So Command, Option, Shift, and hit the letter E. And now we have got a complete version of this image on one layer. It's got everything on it. It's got the background on it. It's got the grill on it. It's got the shadows on it. It's got the floor on it. All of this is happening here. The thing that I'm going to show you right now, you need to know, it will not work on a smart object. It has to be on a complete version of your layer. So you can see, our layer, our, our, what originally built this image was chopped up into layers. We, our floor is not even connected to our background. The grill is not connected to the floor. The shadows are just floating there, whatever. But now, we've brought it all together as a single image. And you need that for this to be, for this to work. Make sense? So I'm going to rename this lay, uh, uh, thing right here. And I'm just going to call it Depth of Field. D-O-F. OK. To actually use this tool, we need to we need to create what is called a depth map, and I'm going to show you what it is, and I'm going to show you how it works, and then we'll actually use it. But we've got to make it first. So to make this depth map, and this is a great trick. So if you don't take anything else away from today, this is the one you want to take. Is this one right here? We're going to come down, and we're going to add an adjustment layer to this. And the adjustment layer we're going to actually add to this is a gradient, not gradient map, but gradient up at the top. And when you bring that on, it will actually come in and you can actually see, I'm going to actually click back out of this really quickly because I need my foreground color to be black and white. So I'm going to cancel out of this really quickly and then simply hit the D key to get your foreground and background colors to default to black and white. And then back to the adjustment layer up and again, gradient, not gradient map, gradient. And I'm going to click on that and it'll actually open this guy up. Now, some of this stuff is sticky, and what is happening right now is that you're seeing it's going from foreground color, which is black, to transparency, because that's the uh, gradient that we were using when we were making shadows, or that's why my screen is doing this. 
you need to change that. In the drop down menu, you'll see this looks just like the drop down menu that exists over here when we're using gradient. We need to change this from this second one, which is foreground to transparent, to the first one, which is foreground to background. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Uh, don't click OK yet. You simply want to click to get that to drop out of that drop down window. Then we can actually do the style of gradient. Right now this is a linear gradient, which means it's going from solid black at the bottom to solid white at the top. We need to change this, and we're going to change this to reflected gradient. And this is exactly the same gradient that we were using when we were trying to paint on that layer mask. And again, now what's happening is, is I'm going from uh, background color to foreground color back to background color. Does that sort of make sense? But the beauty of this is that this is controllable. Remember how hard we had, we just kept re-pulling that gradient over and over and over to try and get the gradient for the layer mask for the Gaussian blur on the floor? This one is controllable, and what I mean by that is that you can actually come over in your image and you can click and you can drag where this gradient actually happens. So you can bring it down closer to the floor that you know it needs to be on. It gets better. You can actually then click on the scale. Now, I just used the scrubby slider. So if, I, if you hover over the word that says scale, you get the scrubby slider. Click and drag to the left, and it reduces it. And you see it compresses your gradient. So if you wanted to go in the other direction, you could expand your gradient. So you could actually click it and take it up past 100, and it would get bigger. But in our case, we want to actually uh, bring this down so it comes in a little bit tighter. Again, I can continue to pull this down a little bit more to sort of like see what's going on. Does this make sense to everybody what's happening? Are we done on this part? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and say okay to that. And then I'm going to drop the opacity of this gradient layer just a little bit. So I'm going to click and drag the opacity down because what I want to see is where this thing is actually falling on the girl. Now in my case, I actually got lucky. The darkest part of that is actually happening right underneath her. And I do feel like that, again, this white area up in here. So what this depth map is going to do is it actually masks our depth of field. Anywhere on our image that is black will be in focus. Anything that is white will be soft. And then anything in these transitions will go from being sharp and focused to soft. Does that make sense for everyone? However, if you double click on your gradient, again, at the very top, you can still position it. So if it ended up being in the wrong position, you can still slide this thing up and down. If you feel like that's not the way that the field would look, I need to expand this a little bit more, you can change your scale and you can actually broaden it out or you can even choke it up tighter. So in my case, I'm going to kick mine down just a little bit more, but this is where I feel like the floor should actually be in focus is right here. So is that working for all of you guys? Are we good on this part? Who is this not working for? All right, so then say OK. Crank your opacity all the way back up again. This is the beginning of our depth map. Everybody good? All right, I need to do more on this. So what more I'm going to do on it is this. I'm going to come back down to where I've got the uh, image of the girl that's completely isolated. It's just her body, right? I'm not going to select it. I'm just going to hover over the icon, hold down the command key, and click to load it as a selection. So this is now a load selection. Are we good on this part? Then I'm going to come up to the top, and I'm going to add a brand new layer up on top, and I'm going to fill this with black. And black is my foreground color. Option delete. Command D to deselect. And now what you can see I've got is I've got a gradient happening on the floor that's right underneath her feet, exactly where it should be, and then her body. There's a little dot right here on her uh, outfit. That is contamination in this um, in the original knockout that we should just go ahead and fix right now. So just zoom into that little spot on her skirt. I don't know if all you guys will have it, but I do. It's just this little spot right here. Hit the B key to get a brush. Make it a small brush, make it a completely hard brush so that you don't overspray anything. And then just fix. Black is still my foreground color, so then I can just fix that guy. So, I would, sorry, things like that just bug the hell out of me. Okay, so this is what we've got right now. Is this making sense to everyone? Then, with this top layer selected, we need to put, them to, to put the two together. So it is, again, Command, Option, Shift, and the letter E, and it does a merge stamp version of what we were just looking at onto its own layer, and this is what it looks like right here. 
Does that make sense to everyone? We good on this? You need to then load this as a selection. Simply command click loads it as a selection. And then we need to save it up to the filter menu, up to the um, uh, select menu, down to save selection, and we're going to call this depth map. And say OK. So now remember, what this is going to do is anywhere on this image that is white will be soft, out of focus. Anywhere that is black will be sharp, in focus. That's what the depth map is about. And these transitions right here are giving us the illusion of depth of field. Kind. I thought I heard somewhere that depth of field works where in front of the subject there's like a third in focus and behind two thirds. You're exactly right, and that's true. So does this software understand that? It's exactly that so we don't what, it what it is doing. That's exactly what it is doing. Again, it is an incredibly complex set of algorithms that are imitating the way a lens really works. And your point is exactly spot on. When you use depth the field, things that are in the foreground actually are softer than the things that are in the background, even if they're equal distance away from what you would consider to be your point of focus. Make sense? What were you naming again? I'm sorry, what? What were you naming the selection? You're naming the selection now. Well, wait. Yeah, so you've got a depth map, the PTH map. Okay. All of these things that we have used to make this, you can throw away. So throw away this top layer, you don't need anymore. Throw away the gradient, you don't need, I mean, the, the, uh, the silhouette of the girl, and throw away the gradient map as well. All of, I mean, not the gradient map, but yeah, the gradient, um, uh, just the gradient gradient, not the gradient map. Does this make sense, everybody? And then if you take a look over in your channels palette down at the very bottom, Mine says depth map and it is completely empty. So let's not do that. Hang on one second. I'm going to go back in history to undelete those layers because that did not save that as a selection. Command D to deselect. Again, I'm going to hover over this image again. Command click. And that is not loading as a selection. Huh. It's not visible. That's my problem as well. My computer has not been happy lately. Maybe the gradient is going to be convex to the multiply to the... Well, if I make a selection, this should be my selection right here. So again, mine was just turned off. So again, I'm going to command click to load that as a selection, but it's not loading any of this part right here. So let's do this instead. There's another way to do this instead. So um, guys, if you take a look, and does your depth map have anything in it? All right, then throw your depth map away. There's an easier way to deal with this. Can't you just like, select the RGB channel? Exactly. That's right where I was going. You can't select the RGB channel, but you can select the red, green, or blue. The RGB one you can't select. If you try to copy the RGB guy, you'll see drag it down, it won't let you actually do a copy of it, but the red or green or blue ones will. So just grab the red one and drag it down. It'll get us to the same place. And rename that red copy depth map. And say OK. Now you can hit Command D to deselect and you can throw those layers away and we'll have what we need. Okay, so you just copy one of the yep. Yeah, and because they're, they're all the same. So does everyone now have a depth map that actually looks like this? Anybody not? Okay. So here's the trick, guys, and we're still working on it. This is going to be on our depth of field layer right here. So I'm going to go back up to the top, and I'm going to click on the whole RGB guy. We're now working on this depth of field layer that we're actually going to use on this. At least you're not looking half here. Okay. What? Not yet, again, not even yet. Okay, so you've got your depth map here, right? Perfect, and then you're on this layer. That's perfect, and just stay there, you're good. Okay, so to use this thing, come up to the filter menu, and come down to blur, down to lens blur. And a dialog box will open up. We are in a completely new workspace right now. This is a Photoshop workspace, but we're in a, a new workspace right now. I'm going to suggest right now you guys leave this on faster, not more accurate, just so that we can see what's going on. But if we were to really employ this later on, I would suggest that you change this to more accurate. Again, this is incredibly processor intensive. So in this drop down menu right here for your sources in here, whatever, I actually need you to pick the, the 
depth map that you just picked. This is looking at all of your channels. So does everybody have that part done? Are we good on that part? Good. So there is a blur focal distance here. You can actually leave this set to zero right now. We're going to actually look at something else here, and I'm going to undo my invert here. What we need to do is this part down here. We need to look. This is actually your lens down here that we are going to look at. If you click on this drop-down menu for shape, you can actually see these are different patterns for, um, uh, for apertures. So I don't know how most of you guys know this, but if you ever look at an aperture closed down, if you ever look at it inside your camera, it's got a certain number of blades on it that actually do that. The more blades that you have, the sort of smoother the circle you have, the fewer blades that you have, the more sort of like uh, a jaggedy, octagonal, edgy kind of thing that you've got in here. This allows you to actually change the number of blades that you have got on here. I'm going to say let's go with this octagonal eight. It's more of a standard lens. Then underneath that, it's actually got a radius, and if you click this radius and crank it all the way up, so I've clicked mine up to about a 50, you can see that it's seriously blurring this background, um, but it's doing other things as well. In a lens blur, what ends up happening is you'll actually end up with the direction of the blur as well, so you sort of have that sense that this floor is coming at us still. It's not just getting, it's not just getting much which is what a Gaussian blur does. Now clearly this is way too strong a blur, but nonetheless. If your image doesn't look like this, hover over your image and you'll see your cursor changes to a little plus. If you click on that little plus, it will invert where the point of that focus actually happens. So in this case now, it's actually just flipped it. It's actually saying, okay, we're gonna focus the background and not the image, but that would defeat the whole purpose of what we've done. So click back on the girl again, and you'll actually see it comes back into focus. Now, uh, clearly this uh, radius of 50 is too strong, so I'm going to drag this back to make to the point that I feel like this actually is a believable uh, blur on this guy. And I don't know, yes. I was just showing that in case. You would never want to click on that background to do it like that and then go back to the girl, whatever. It's just in case it just wasn't working for someone. I just wanted to make sure that we got back to where we were. Did it work for you again? Did you pick your depth map again? So there's other things that you can actually control in here. They don't do a whole lot, but you'll actually see them. When we talk about blade curvature and rotation, what we're really talking about is bokeh. Now, some people have come up uh, always knowing that phrase or that name is bokeh, and now Apple has come out and they actually are using bokeh as the name for the way it actually functions in their lenses. Do you guys know what I'm talking about when we talk about this? It's when it's the out of focus, circles in the background that you have and you see them, you know, it's like car lights that are out of focus in the photograph, whatever. They take on the shape of the lens. You actually can see this, the blades of the lens. These things are here control the bokeh. So this is their blade curvature. Again, this will smooth it out or sharpen it up. The rotation. If you're unhappy, let's say your bokeh is actually shaped like this. It's got, and it's a point like this. You can actually use your rotation to move it around to get it to be more pleasing as a composition for you. So that's what's going on here. We do not have any specular highlights in this. If we did, this could actually control those because spectro, specular highlights tend to flare in a uh, depth of field situation more so than the area that's around them. So it's actually separating out the specular highlights and controlling how strong that that part of it happens. But then the last thing, so most of the people don't deal with other than the shape of this guy, uh, again, building the depth map for this guy, uh, dealing with the specular highlights. But the thing that most people do do is this down here, is the noise. Because one of the problems that we run into with all this blurring in a digital world is that this eliminates any notion of grain. If you were to shoot this with film, or if this was real, if this was digital and it was simply out of focus, this would still have digital grain to it. It would still have your, your, your pixel content to it. That's all been smoothed out. We need to restore that. And that's what noise is all about. So if you zoom in on this guy, 
you can actually click on the amount of noise and you can crank it up. And I'm going to actually ask you to crank it way up and you'll see that it's actually returning noise only to the areas that are actually being impacted by this, the soft focus part. There are two different distributions for this. There is uniform and Gaussian. Gaussian is just, again, it's another mathematical term. Gaussian tends to be a little bit more organic. If this needed to have color noise, so when we were looking at Jim's picture the other day, and I said there's a lot of color noise in that, if we were trying to emulate color noise, you can actually uncheck monochrome, and this will actually introduce color noise as well. So these are grain emulators, or noise emulators, to be really honest with you. That's what's going actually on here. In my case, for this image, there was no, uh, uh, there was no, in that first original file, there was no color noise in that. So I am going to leave it at monochrome. I am going to leave it at Gaussian, but I'm going to crank this thing way down. I'm, I'm not trying to make this anywhere near that bad. And you can see, in my case, I'm down like a three. You can actually go to your arrow keys right now and drop these down. And if you go all the way down to zero, that's no noise at all. If you pop it up in a one or a two, actually that two seems like it's bringing back just enough believability to me. So that's where I'm going to leave mine. Make sense what's going on here? All right, so I ended up, I'm going to back out again. I ended up with a radius of about a 10. Where did you guys end up that made you feel like this was believable? I think mine was like six or so. Like a six or so, other guys? Seven, we have a six or seven, Jimmy. 14? Well, okay, it's, 10 sounds like an average, so I'm just going to leave it at that, and we're going to go ahead and say okay. Now, again, one of the downsides to this is that we cannot, this is not a smart object. That is a destructive move. If we save this file and close it right now, this is committed, but it's on its own layer. So I'm going to do a snapshot of this really quick, and we're going to call this lens blur, and say okay to that. And then I'm gonna zoom in on this guy a little bit. And we can go back and forth. So go back to the very top of your history palette and pick your Gaussian blur version and pick your lens blur. Boom laka laka. Game changer. True illusion of depth of field, not just blurring shit. Are there questions about this? All right, guys. Um, uh, it's exactly 2.30 almost. Um, so if you can be back at quarter three, we have a lot to get through today. And I'm sure that's the first time you've